Well, thank you very much for that warm introduction. It is a, an honor and a privilege to be here with you today. Though it's my first time in Saudi Arabia, I feel like I've been greeted like an old friend, and I have all of you to thank for that. This is a very exciting time for the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, as well as for the world. And that's because we are on the brink of a second digital age. So the first digital age brought us the computer, the microprocessor, and with it, the mainframe, the PC, the uh, internet, the mobile web. And it has had a profound impact on our daily lives, on our business, and on the world. And we are now entering this new era of the digital age, where technology is everywhere. It is ubiquitous. And there are many new technologies that are beginning to change our world in very profound ways. Artificial intelligence and machine learning, the Internet of Things, technology in our bodies, new sources of clean energy, and so forth. And all of these new technologies are foundational to the next era of progress, and they are also foundational to Saudi Vision 2030. But there is one technology in particular that is going to have a greater impact than any, than any other. And it might surprise many of you to learn that it is the enabling technology of crypto assets like Bitcoin, and it's called the blockchain. I'm not going to speak to you today about digital currencies per se, but to tell you a little bit about a new technology that I believe represents nothing short of the second era of the internet. So let me explain what I mean by that. When you use the internet today to send and move information, you're not sending an original unique thing. You're sending a version or a copy. So if you send an email to someone, you can send the same email to someone else. If you attach a PDF, you can send that same document to many people. If you type something into Twitter, it's available for all to see. So the first era of the internet, the internet that we know so well, it's kind of like a printing press for information that everyone gets to control. And it has had a very profound impact on a lot of information-based industries, like, say, media or publishing. When it comes to things that have value, though, being able to create copies is not such a good idea. So instead of sending a PDF with this PowerPoint presentation, let's say that I owed you money. Well, it's very important that when I send that money, that you know you've got the only version, that I can't create copies of that money the way I could with, say, that PDF. And this is a specific computer science problem that smart people tried to figure out throughout basically the whole first era of the internet. It's called the double spend problem. How do you ensure that when you move something of value using a digital means, that you aren't able to create another version, that there isn't a, a trail of digital breadcrumbs? Because it's great for all of us to have our own printing press for information by and large, but it's not so great for everyone to have their own printing press for money. And because of this very specific problem, we have remained reliant upon middlemen, intermediaries, who uh, existed obviously before the first era of the internet, but if anything, have grown more powerful during its emergence. And these uh, intermediaries would be familiar to many people. Of course, there are, are banks and other financial intermediaries, governments, and so forth. But actually, the most powerful intermediaries of this first era of the digital age are digital conglomerates like Amazon and Apple or social media companies like Facebook. They, along with financial intermediaries, perform essential functions in the economy online, just as they did offline. They establish identities in transactions. Who's the buyer? Who's the seller? Who's the sender? Who's the receiver? They perform business logic, uh, contracting, record keeping, and so forth. And they create trust between parties so that we know when we interact with them that they are maintaining a record of who owes what to whom and who owns what so that we can't have that problem, right, of sending the same thing twice. Now, overall, intermediaries have done a decent job, but they have some very specific limitations. They're centralized, which makes them vulnerable to hacking or to attack. They add friction to transactions. In the case of remittances, according to the World Bank, it takes uh, on average five to seven days and costs around 9% for money to move across uh, borders on average. They exclude big parts of the population. 
His Excellency described a situation in Pakistan where there are, are 100 million or so people who lack access to financial services. There are many complex reasons for that, but one of them is that it's hard in many instances for people to get a bank account because they lack an identity, they don't have a government-issued ID, or they may not meet the minimum balance requirement to have a bank. I don't know if that's the case in Pakistan. I'm just saying, in general, those are some major concerns. And when it comes to big technology companies, there's a, a, a very troubling trend, which is that they capture all of this data and all of this information about users online, whether it's transaction data or social data and so forth, and they own it and they get to monetize it, even though technically it's the user that creates it. So what if the internet was entering a second era? What if, instead of having an internet of information, we could have an internet of value or assets. So in 2008, an anonymous person or persons uh, named Satoshi Nakamoto created this thing called Bitcoin. And what was really amazing about Bitcoin was that it worked. It worked in the sense that it solved the double spend problem. For the first time in human history, we had a way to move something of value peer to peer on the internet without the need for a middleman. And it worked so well that it has set off this spark, which has really caught on like wildfire and, and spread to all aspects of the economy. Now, Bitcoin is what you'd consider a cryptocurrency. And there are lots of ways in which cryptocurrencies and governments and central banks intersect. But the underlying technology of blockchain is more benign than that. It's not ideological. It is simply put the world's first digital medium for value. And all that means is that in the same way that the internet transformed how we move and store information, blockchain is going to change how we move and store value. And the way it does that is through this distributed ledger, which is another description of the word blockchain. So in a traditional setting, a bank or another intermediary maintains a ledger of transactions, and that gives them status as a trusted intermediary. A blockchain is simply put a distributed ledger, where a copy of each ledger exists on any computer that's connected to the network, and it's available for all to see. Any single person can access and look at the ledger, but no single entity can alter its results. The only way that it can get updated is by the network reaching consensus. So in other words, it acts as a trusted, immutable record of transactions. It could be that those transactions are for currencies. It could also be that they're for something completely unrelated, like stocks and bonds, or loyalty points, or any other manner of assets. I find that the discussion around uh, blockchain often reminds me of this parable of the blind men and the elephant, where there are a bunch of men standing around the elephant, and they're each touching a different part. One's touching the tail, another's touching the ear, another's touching the trunk, and they all say it feels like something different, uh, different a snake, a rope, uh, the bark of a tree, and so forth. What's happening here is more than just the reimagining of, of money. That is one of about nine different things that's happening here. That's touching one part of the elephant. What's actually happening is a reimagination of how we move and store value. The industry that, where this is having the greatest impact, unsurprisingly, is in financial services. This is a thing called a Rube Goldberg machine, which is a complicated apparatus that performs a bunch of steps, and in the end, it solves a simple problem, like it cracks an egg or opens a door. In many respects, elements of our financial industry work like this, and the reason, in large part, is because new systems are built on top of old systems, so that we've got mainframes running software from the 1970s doing a lot of essential functions inside of the financial system. One solution to this is this thing called fintech. Fintech is this reimagining of how banking works. My personal opinion is that blockchain, which I define here as decentralized finance, is actually going to eclipse fintech. You can think of fintech as a new uh, user interface. It's a new and simpler way to access the old world of financial services through a mobile device, through a desktop computer, through a new app. And that's important, and that may lower barriers for financial inclusion and improve access. But fundamentally, it's nothing but digital wallpaper. It is a new coat of paint that covers the way the old industry works. DeFi is something different. DeFi is reimagining financial services 
from its core functions. Everything from moving money to storing money to lending money and so forth. And this is made possible by a thing called a smart contract. This is really the only technical part of the talk. Bitcoin is a very simple thing. It's this digital asset that's represented as an entry in a distributed ledger. You move Bitcoin from one person to another, they can move it back to you. That's about all that Bitcoin can do. A smart contract basically mimics the logic of a, of a contract, but written into software, where you don't necessarily need lawyers and escrow agents and courts and other intermediaries to enforce the terms. So in financial services, a lot of applications and a lot of assets are actually nothing more than contracts, agreements between parties. A share in a company is a contract that gives you a piece of a common enterprise with certain rights, like say the, vote, the right to vote on um, governance matters or the right to cash flows if the company pays a dividend. That's true in large part in many aspects of the industry. DeFi is one of the fastest growing industries in the world. Uh, measured by user growth. It's worth also keeping this in perspective. We're looking at an industry that has maybe five or six million people. Population of Riyadh, 7.5 million people. So this whole industry is still, the, the DeFi space, which is a subsector of, of digital assets, is smaller in terms of users than the population of the city that we're in right now. But it's growing tremendously in terms of dollar value. And it's also growing tremendously in terms of uh, VC investment and VC interest. The amount of VC money that has gone into uh, this industry in the past year exceeds all of the money that has gone into the industry in any prior year combined. Uh, at $25 billion, it is a significant share of total venture capital investing, most of it coming from the United States. So just very briefly, the financial services industry, and it's one that many people here know very well, it, uh, it, it performs many essential functions in the economy. It is more than just any one industry. It is the lifeblood of all industry. It is the thing that connects us together. The nine things that it does, everything from giving us a way to move and store money, to lend money, to insure against risk, to organize financial information, many of these things are beginning to be disrupted by decentralized finance. We talked about digital banking, um, and how that can improve inclusion. One of the big innovations that uh, this technology allows for is a digital wallet. Now, not an application that allows you to access your account with the bank through your phone, but a piece of software on a device that allows you to hold digital bearer goods. In other words, the money, let's say it's a stable coin or Bitcoin, that you hold on your phone is not a representation of what's held inside of a bank or a central bank, it's a digital bearer good. And the amount of value that's held in these digital uh, bearer wallets has grown significantly. Now you might think this is individuals who are, are trying to be their own bank, and that is true, that is a lot of it. But increasingly we're seeing multi-signature wallets where in, many indiv parties together can access funds being used for institutions and asset management firms. A second area is in moving money. A, uh, one, one of the CEOs of one of the largest banks in Canada once said to me, we move money. And because we move money, we get to store money. And because we store money, we get to lend money. And lending is our business. So if you disrupt the, the moving portion of what we do, it starts to have an impact on other parts of our business. The moving money is arguably having the greatest impact, not by Bitcoin as some medium of exchange or store of value, because we know that Bitcoin has certain limitations. It's more volatile than a lot of people are used to for a medium of exchange. Many things are not priced in Bitcoin, so it becomes hard to value goods, but they are in US dollars. And that's why one of the biggest innovations of DeFi and of this whole industry is the creation of stable coins. The, number, the dollar value of stable coins in circulation this time last year was $25 billion. At the end of the year, it was $170 billion, and today it continues to increase. And stable coins today are used as the payment rail for the digital asset world. So if you're you know, buying and selling digital assets, you use stable coins. But they've had yet to have a, a major impact in what we call the real world. However, stable coins allow you to move money peer-to-peer -peer between people with digital wallets 
anywhere in the world in a matter of seconds or minutes, and depending on the blockchain, for, for little to no fees. So what I described earlier, this issue with remittances, where a $800 billion a year market uh, has average fees of 9% could be disrupted by this. It's also being used in parts of the world where people may be concerned about the local currency. And this is a legitimate concern if I were a central banker in Turkey, for example, during the recent currency uh, crisis, the number one pair against the lira was not dollars or euros. It was actually a, a US dollar stable coin called Tether, which has its own issues. But interestingly, people were willing to look past those issues in order to get money into some form of dollar-backed reserves. In my view, having access to the moving and storing of value are the basic building blocks of financial inclusion. If you look at crypto ownership um, in the region and financial inclusion in the region, it paints a very interesting picture. There are still many parts of the world, as we heard, where financial inclusion is not absolute. Even in the United States, which people think of as an advanced economy, according to the OECD, 37 million people are unbanked or underbanked. A lot of them are migrants. So this is a problem that exists in many parts of the world. Crypto ownership in these different countries is still relatively small, though I will point out that India, because of its uh, very large denominator, has one of the largest markets for uh, crypto users in the world at over 100 million. Another very interesting topic is lending. So moving money, we get to move money, we get to store money, we get to lend money. Now, I don't want to overstate the size of this market because by comparison to banks and even some uh, institutions in this, in this room, these numbers might feel small by comparison. But what's important to understand is the growth. So this is an example I was describing to someone last night, and the person thought I was nuts, but I'm going to give it a shot one more time, which is the idea of a lending pool. So normally, if you want to get a loan, you go to a bank, the bank offers you a loan, you post collateral, maybe it's a house, or, or maybe it's you know, securities or other financial assets. A lending pool is a smart contract, what I described earlier, where you basically put collateral in the form of digital assets into a piece of software. And then that software provides you with a loan. So you might think, well, wait a minute. What if I just take the money and run? Well, the point of these uh, pools is that they're over collateralized. So if you were to not repay, then they could simply seize all of your assets. And the way that this works is that they are programmed so that if the value of your collateral declines, you can be liquidated. Anybody who's ever had a margin account, I'm not sure how many people have, but a margin account works very similarly. You have a million dollars of securities in your brokerage account. The brokerage is prepared to lend you $500,000 to, to continue to invest. If the uh, value of your collateral declines, you might get a margin call. This is like an automated margin call in the form of software. Another very interesting area is in investment aggregation. So mutual funds and ETFs are the types of fund structures we normally rely on for investing, right? For a indiv regular individual investor who's got $10,000, they will put their money into an ETF or a mutual fund. This also can be automated using smart contracts. Another pool called Wi-Fi is what's called a yield aggregator, where basically you put your money into this contract and it goes out and seeks out the best return across a, a range of investments. You're not putting your money inside of an ETF provider, investment manager. It's all via software. Exchanging value. Stock exchanges and other um, marketplaces is typically how we exchange financial assets. And those rely on a centralized order book. A company that uses a centralized order book, one, one example is Coinbase. If you're familiar with Coinbase, it's the largest crypto asset exchange in the United States. It has a market cap that's larger than the NASDAQ. And on some days, a decentralized exchange, which is nothing more than a smart contract, does more daily volume than Coinbase does and lists more different and more and different kinds of assets. So again, all of this is today pretty much self-contained to the world of digital goods. So you might be asking, what does this have to do with me? Well, the thing is, if it can work and scale in this ecosystem, there's no reason why a stock exchange couldn't be a decentralized order book that connects buyers and sellers using smart contracts. Earlier, His Excellency said that on CoinMarketCap, there are at least 17,000 
different cryptocurrencies. They're actually way more than that. I don't know how many, tens of thousands. And a comment that I get from a lot of people is, why do we need all of these currencies? You know, we have a system today where many nation states have their own currency, and that doesn't seem to work that well. There's a lot of friction, cross-border, and so forth. And my answer to that is, you're correct. There don't need to be all these different kinds of currencies. And this is the key thing. If, if you leave with anything today, it's this. Blockchain is a digital medium for value. What that means is you can create digital versions of any kind of asset. So they can be anything from currencies, I suppose, though I would say Bitcoin's pretty limited as a, as a currency, to votes in an election, to loyalty points, to in-game purchases that your kids might make when they play Fortnite, to securities that you might trade. This is a technology platform. It is a benign, relatively benign in that respect. It has no ideology or no moral agency. And I don't know if this is an exhaustive list. These are the nine different types of basically what they call crypto assets, but digital goods that exist today. Pardon me. And coming soon is a book that I've written called Digital Asset Revolution, where I explain this in uh, great detail. So, cryptocurrencies. Bitcoin was designed to be a medium of exchange, a store of value, a unit of account. And it works okay doing in that respect. Really, it functions a lot more like digital gold, um, in the sense that it is a form of savings that is not created by government, that cannot be inflated away, that is relatively difficult to create and has a limited supply that grows slowly over time. Things that are sort of similar to gold. And the fact that it's declined 35% from its peak is frankly irrelevant from an investment standpoint. You know, Tesla has declined more. You wouldn't therefore conclude that it's a terrible investment. Same applies for almost any other company um, that could go down in value. But it is probably limited as a medium of exchange and as a global payment system, which is why I think stable coins are actually far more interesting in that respect. We have seen a lot of widespread adoption. Um, most of this is uh, what I would describe as a money grab. <laughs> PayPal and, and other uh, companies see an opportunity to host wallets and to get people trading, and they can earn fees in that respect. But in some cases, there is a belief that this is going to have a profound impact. The second, and, and I would argue more interesting kind of uh, digital asset, is what I'd call a, what's called a protocol token. So basically, these are the tokens of the platforms where all of these new kinds of applications are getting built. Sort of like the Apple App Store, right? Where you've got this App Store, and in the App Store, there's all these different applications. The more applications in the App Store, the more money goes to Apple because they take a 30% fee on every sale, including sales of uh, assets inside of those applications. Similarly, the more applications that get built on these platforms, the more demand, because most of these applications are transaction-based, decentralized finance and so forth, the more demand there is for the native token. So Ethereum, if you've heard of that, is the second largest crypto asset in the world. It's got a market capitalization bigger than JP Morgan. And it has grown to this size in large part because of the growth and excitement around the applications built on top of it. But whereas Bitcoin, I think, stands alone as this digital gold, Ethereum has many competitors. And in its early days, Ethereum uh, controlled 100% of all transaction volume in DeFi, just as an example. By the end of last year, it was about 65%. So investing, not that I'm here to provide investment advice, but this is not like a currency. These things are not designed to be a store of value. It's more like owning a basket of tech stocks where three out of five of them might not pan out. So when these things go up and down in value, it's not to say that they're not a store of value because they were never intended to be. They're a directional bet on the usefulness and the growth of these ecosystems. Just like owning Apple shares is a directional bet on the growth of um, handset sales and on iOS application growth. Governance tokens is yet another kind of token. Again, not currencies. These are designed to be more like the shares of the companies that are built on platforms. But they have used utility inside of the application. They give it a hybrid between a share and a loyalty point. NFTs, again, totally different. NFTs are the opposite of a currency. Currencies are supposed to be fungible, interchangeable. Every dollar should be changeable with every other dollar. Um, 
non-fungible tokens are the opposite of that. They are very unique or rare digital goods. So what are some things that are unique and rare? Artwork, collectibles, and so forth. And that's where NFTs have found an early product market fit. But fundamentally, I think that's just the first iteration of NFTs. The thing that I find is most interesting about NFTs is their application to digital identity. Certain works of art are very rare or unique. Another thing that's very rare or unique is me and you. Every person in this room has unique identifiers that make them who they are. We can use NFTs to tokenize those attributes to create a digital identity, which you can use perhaps one day to interact with your bank, to get a bank account, to open up um, you know, an account, to interact with others online. NFT sales had their big bang year last year. In 2020, there were maybe 40 or $50 million of sales. Last year, there were $11 billion, which is about 15% of the size of the total art market. So you could say that NFTs have gone maybe a little too far too fast. That's personally my belief. And I'm not here to make a judgment call on the value of any single NFTs. Frankly, I don't understand many of them. But this is clearly something that people care about. So again, NFTs are a form of digital asset. And I think NFTs are going to be foundational to the metaverse. So I described this issue of digital identity. Well, if you're planning on being in Mark Zuckerberg's metaverse, where it's going to be your Facebook account that's going to allow you to access stuff, you don't have to worry about this. But I think a lot of people are concerned about these giants of the first era of the internet owning and controlling a virtual world where we might spend more and more time. So what we're going to need is a form of identity that isn't tied to any single company like Facebook or to any single government, because we want to be able to move throughout the metaverse and take our digital goods with us. In order to do that, we need a way to prove who we are, and NFTs are going to be foundational to that. Exchange tokens, again, a totally different kind of thing. These are basically like loyalty points that exist inside of uh, uh, applications, typically uh, exchanges. They give you rewards, they allow you to trade for free, um, you know, certain benefits like that. It's a small category, but again, the key thing is not a currency. And then another really interesting area are securities tokens. Securities tokens are digital goods that are supposed to represent securities, stocks and bonds, and other financial assets. And today, they're being created in a, a number of different kinds of ways. There are what I would say are digitally native securities, where companies are going raising capital by selling shares that are crypto assets. Uh, another area is people are creating derivatives that tra track the value of certain crypto of certain regular assets. So you can buy synthetic virtual versions of Amazon and Apple. So again, those are not shares uh, in the traditional sense. You don't have uh, a claim of ownership over that piece of the company. You don't have the right to vote. They are derivatives, but derivatives are still securities. And then the most interesting thing are big banks and other financial intermediaries who themselves are creating digital assets like Santander. So T Santander actually created a fork, a private permission fork of the Ethereum network where they launched their own digital good. So again, if big global banks are creating digital assets, you have to think carefully about how you want to approach them. And then um, stable coins. I think I've talked a little bit about that already. Most stable coins are pegged to the US dollar. And this is something, if I were um, looking at it from outside of the US, and I, I, I'm, by the way, I'm Canadian, so I do look at it from outside the US, uh, would could cause me some concern. Because I think one of the things that people want really badly in the world is a US dollar bank account, a way to move and store dollars. And if anybody can access US dollar stable coins, then it could lead to the to the hyper-dollarization of a lot of different kinds of economies. So this is a thing that I think is something that would um, concern me or I would think very hard about if I was looking at it from outside the United States. Natural asset tokens are digital goods that are backed by hard assets in the real world. An example of this is carbon credits. So carbon credits um, are created from forestry and other conservation projects. There are currently a bunch of different registries for carbon offsets. And there's a lack of trust in the authenticity of them. So one big decentralized ledger of carbon offsets where people could, be, where credits could be created and then retired would be a better system than the one we have now. And the demand for carbon offsets will continue to outstrip the supply for the coming future. So we need new reasons for people to bring projects online. 
And then the second thing is central bank digital currencies. I'd like to think that I come at this topic pretty honestly. I've written extensively on the subject, including for the Financial Post, Canada's leading business newspaper, because it was actually our former governor of the central bank, Mark Carney, who then went on to be the governor of the Bank of England, who made the case um, at a major event uh, in the United States that, at uh, Jackson Hole, Wyoming, that maybe the solution for the future of money is a, not, a single, uh, not a central bank currency backed by any single government money. In fact, he made the case that the US dollar probably has too big of a role in the world. It's 11% of the GDP, but it's 70% of transaction volumes. His case was, why don't we create a basket of uh, different currencies and create basically the equivalent of, of um, John Maynard Keynes's uh, Bancor, which is sort of this you know, floating basket. And that's actually, funny enough, was the design principle originally that Facebook had in mind, which is one of the reasons they reached such uh, fierce opposition, <laughs> because governments were, the US was legitimately concerned they were trying to create some alternate monetary regime. I think when it comes from a central bank, it's a little bit more palatable. But central bank digital currencies are, I think, going to have a really big role to play in the world. China has been working on a central bank digital currency for seven years and has deployed it in a number of different cities and has apparently 100 million users. And they're using this Olympics, actually, as a way to continue to promote that. There are at least 60 different CBDC projects all around the world. Based on our analysis, most of these have not gotten past the feasibility stage, and many of them are just PowerPoint presentations. Um, today, China, major economies, is the only country that is doing serious work in this space. China has a couple of, of goals, obviously. Um, if it can control every transaction and have perfect information, then that strengthens the single party state. But also, they'd like to knock the US off of its perch as the global reserve currency and see this CBDC as, as a way of doing that by creating um, ties to uh, Africa, the Belt and Road Project, with this currency as the thread. So, where does where do we all fit into this whole thing? Well, on one hand is the traditional world of, of um, centralized finance, and over here is the wild, weird world of DeFi. And I don't think quite yet that everyone needs to be worried about DeFi. As I pointed out, it has fewer users than the population of Riyadh, though it's grown at 10,000% in the last 18 months. Um, I think most of the innovation today, where there's real tangible benefits, is happening in the middle. So digital assets, crypto assets, are a $1.8 trillion market. And I think a lot of banks, because of their role as a trusted intermediary, have an opportunity to become the custodians of digital goods. So a lot of people like Bitcoin and these other assets because they get to be their own bank, meaning they get to store their own money on their own device, and they don't, they're not worried about seizure and so forth. Most people don't want that. Most people want to live their life and do their job and sell their wares and raise their kids. They don't care about thinking about their money at all times. So there's a big role for banks to act as a custodian for digital goods. In the United States, um, recent changes, potential changes, or changes to the rules uh, at the OCC, the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency, um, have, hel have, have helped us realize this. So U.S. Bank, um, uh, for example, and BNY Mellon, big custodial banks, are launching digital asset custody solutions, just as an example. Another area is in um, creating what's called compliant DeFi. So one of the big issues around DeFi would be KYC and AML. If you're dealing with a smart contract, you don't know necessarily who's on the other side. Maybe it is a criminal, potentially, that's you know using this protocol. But this technology can be what's called forked, so you can create your own version of it and create a permission system where you, know, you could say only banks that are chartered in Saudi Arabia, the Saudi Arabian Central Bank, and other key stakeholders can trade in this pool. And this would be a way, a marketplace, to connect individuals in a compliant and KYC manner. So there's all these different kinds of examples of what can be done. One of the concerns that I have um, is around regulating prematurely. I think the regulators and central banks have an essential role to play in this market. This is not like the first era of the, the first era of the internet uh, transformed information industries 
And information industries are regulated in the U.S. by the FCC, but they're far more lightly regulated than financial services. So there's obviously going to be a critical role for government to play. But by regulating too quickly and without consideration for where this could go, you could have unintended consequences. So in Victorian England, when the first automobiles were created, they introduced these laws called red flag laws. And red flag laws required that any car, any self-powered locomotive, uh, needed at least two operators. It needed a driver, but it also needed a red flag man. And the purpose of the red flag man was to walk in front of the car like this, waving a red flag and making a bunch of noise. Why? Well, the reason was that people in the government were concerned that this new contraption, noisy, smelly thing was going to spook people and horses. It was designed to make sure that horses were not scared. So in order to pr protect the old mode of transportation, they put these onerous laws on the new mode of transportation. And as a result, some might argue the UK ceded leadership in automobile production to Germany and the US and others. I don't know about that. But the point is that the laws had an unintended consequence. And they come about because I think these kinds of things can come about because leaders of, of the old paradigm have a hard time embracing the new. Jamie Dimon, who's an incredibly brilliant individual and an amazingly successful business person who has ably run a giant bank for more than a decade, continues to say that Bitcoin is worthless. And if you dig into his comments, um, you realize that he, he, doesn't, he hasn't actually spent any time to, to think about this or consider this seriously. Um, which is so surprising, given how intelligent and how capable a person he is. Um, there's a second part to this quote, of course. He says, I personally think Bitcoin is worthless, but our clients disagree. And if you know anything about J.P. Morgan's clients, some of them are pretty smart. But his comments, to me, sort of reflect a broader trend that happens every time the new, new thing comes along. By the way, sometimes a new thing comes along, and it starts off as a hobby or a toy, and it remains a hobby or a toy, and it never scales, right? So that's a critique that some people make of, of blockchain, that this is interesting for certain things, but can it really ever achieve anything more? And people have made similar comments in the past, whether it's the invention of the radio or the car um, or different political systems. Leaders of old paradigms have a hard time embracing the new. They react with derision, with humor, and eventually with hostility. And I want to leave you just with one final thought about the nature of, of exponential growth in technology. I'm sure some of you are familiar with the concept of Moore's Law, the idea that the number of semiconductors that can be added to a motherboard can double every 18 months, and that's something that has held broadly true since the invention of the semiconductor in the 1950s uh, and 60s. And it applies, I think, generally to all technology. So the, the story goes something like this. The, the king of the land is so pleased with this uh, new game, chess, that's been brought to him by one of the members of his court. That he offers him anything he wants in the kingdom as a reward, whatever his heart desires. And the man says, sire, I appreciate your act of goodwill, but I am a humble servant, and all I request is some rice to feed my family. But I want you to provide it for me in the following way. One grain on the first piece of the chessboard, two grains on the second, four grains on the third, eight grains on the fourth, and so forth. And the king, who maybe is a great leader but not a great mathematician, says, no problem, your wish is granted. Of course, eight becomes 16, becomes 32, and so on and so forth. So by halfway through the chessboard, it's more rice than the kingdom can produce in a, in a single year. And by the end of the chessboard, it's enough rice to cover the whole of planet Earth in two meters of rice. Now there's a, a side to the story where the king becomes very upset and chops his head off. <laughs> Let me assure you, that won't happen to you folks. But I think that the metaphor um, is a good one for the evolution of technology. So from the invention of the computer, as we know it, to today, the world has changed in profound ways. Uh, I think we can all agree. And to me, I think we're sort of at this, the middle of the chessboard. We're the second era of the digital age. And I mentioned other technologies, by the way, whether it's AI and IoT and blockchain and these others, are going to continue to accelerate 
the change and the pace of growth. And I want you all to be prepared and armed with the knowledge to not only survive but to thrive in this new reality. Thank you very much. It's been an absolute honor and a privilege to be here. And I look forward to the panel discussion. Thank you.